So let's uh, move on to an, our keynote session for today. We have Dave Vosberg, um, Chief Financial Officer and Head of Emerging Technology for Sensei Ag. So Dave is a serial entrepreneur of Dutch descent who has successfully led five startups of his own and he joined Sensei, Sensei Ag with nearly two decades of international financial business development and technology experience. Dave is also our mentor for plug and play, Actic and food tech programs based in Silicon Valley. Hi everyone. Um, if, uh, if someone would uh, start my video, I'm unable to start it. Now, there we go. Okay. Well, thanks uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, hopefully I can share kind of a little bit of my thinking um, on, on the ag tech space uh, and how agriculture is, is shifting. Um, so hopefully now you can, you guys can all see my, uh, screen, um, at least says that I'm sharing my screen. Um, so what are the shifts in agriculture happening? I mean, a lot of these themes are going to be, um, uh, pretty well known to you all and you're living them day to day. Uh, but it's always helpful to step back and, and think about, you know, the, the major clusters of things that are happening. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, predictive agriculture and how that's impacting, you know, everything from food safety to efficiency, um, next-gen proteins, uh, how consumer sentiment is changing, uh, which obviously is impacting packaging requirements, um, and then what we're going to see coming up in, in new genetics, uh, and then also something where I spend a lot of my time is uh, novel farming techniques. <clears throat> but of course, what talk wouldn't be complete without at least touching on COVID um, because it really has reformed our perception of the supply chain, uh, but also uh, the value of food and how it travels. Um, so I think everyone's been affected down to the retailers, but also the nation states. So. Uh, at least on the protected ag front, we're seeing a lot of feedback that there's a strong desire for more local food production within large countries like the United States, but also an increased focus on um, local food production in, in smaller nations, um, especially those who are supplied by, by few um, countries and or don't have their own food production and are importing most of their food. So we've seen a lot of this uh, throughout the, the last few months, but I think even before that, you know, we had challenges with food distribution throughout the world. Um, of course, poor distribution and long distribution chains led to poor nutritional value, uh, micronutrients, and then of course, consumer behavior. Um, and then as Brian touched on earlier, um, a lot of the ag um, practices have created challenges around uh, carbon creation and human wildlife conflict. So looking at predictive agriculture, um, where are things moving? And this is both outdoors and indoors. Um, you know, camera technology, for example, is being put on everything from uh, center pivot irrigation to indoor uh, rails inside greenhouses. Mainly because, you know, growers have been using their guts for a long time and it has served them well. However, uh, technology can now help them improve that further. So, uh, you know, vision and data capture, AI, neural networks, machine learning, all these buzzwords that we hear about really are starting to drive value on the software side and the vision side for agriculture. Whether you're driving a John Deere tractor or you're harvesting leafy greens in a, in a greenhouse. So more data allows farmers to spend more time focused on making decisions and acting on intelligence and acting on challenges they're facing rather than walking the fields. Uh, it also allows them to reduce waste. So previously where there were areas of uh, poor performance and um, they weren't able to identify or address all those areas, 
now because they're spending more time addressing problems, they're able to address more of those areas. They're getting more consistent yields, higher yields, uh, higher quality product, uh, which is going directly to their bottom line. And all this leads to profit, right? So um, predictive agriculture, precision agriculture has a lot of different names, but this is something that um, is growing in importance. And there's a consumer side of it I'll touch on shortly. Uh, but first, to, you know, talking about next-gen proteins, um, I'm sure many of you in the region will find, will see the the plant on the right is familiar, as it originates at least partially from uh, from Thailand. Uh, it's duckweed or lemna, uh, new superfood that has equal protein content, or sometimes people consider higher protein content than um, than chickpeas and and soy. Um, but doesn't have some of the uh, phytoestrogen uh, challenges. Um, so, you know, new, um, I would say plants are being identified to scale in their production to address some of these plant-based protein needs. And I'm certain that uh, as we get to seeds, we'll talk about, you know, some of those that are being bred. Up above, you see some bioreactors. Um, you know, uh, there was a company just recently announced uh, almost a hundred million dollar raise focused on uh, bioreactor. Uh, driven protein compounds um, that are that are not impacting uh, the earth even to the scale that lemna might. Um, so that's another uh, leg of the stool. And then we're finding that people are, because they're looking for more efficient sources of protein and alternative sources of protein, they're turning to insects. Of course, something that's that's much uh, that's pretty common throughout the world, uh, be, but it's becoming more accepted uh, in areas where it was previously considered. Um, not as common. Um, so we're seeing a lot of these ingredients and a lot of new mixtures of food in the food tech side, uh, which are leading to kind of delightful uh, combinations where you can have, uh, you know, some new products that, that contain the nutrition you're looking for. And that brings us, us to kind of how consumer sentiment is changing. Um, you know, the previous food system was engineered around efficiency, engineered around cost. Um, it was not engineered around nutrition or delight or health. And that's all changing uh, rather quickly. Um, people want uh, both the freshness and the local and the quick service, but they also wanna know it's nutritious for them, sustainably grown, chemical free, GMO free, it's socially conscious and transparent, you know, tick, tick, tick. Uh, the requirements are getting higher. However, I think, you know, modern tools give us the capabilities to address those requirements. Um, and as we pivot to creating these new foods that delight, fresher foods that delight, um, I think there's also this, at the same time, the ability to create significant economic value for companies uh, in creating these new brands in creating these new categories that will drive uh, future consumer adoption. And of course, you know, part of that requirement as well is sustainable packaging. Um, and this doesn't have to be, I mean, this is kind of a little bit of an old story, but it, and it doesn't have to be um, a, a added cost to the business. Oftentimes it's just a matter of being creative and focusing on ways to package in a more sustainable way that's gonna allow you to um, drive down your costs and make the consumer happier. And more and more innovations will, are coming out on this. And I imagine we'll see, you know, plant-based plastic, especially take off in the next three years and become uh, something that we wouldn't even think of differently. Uh, you know, and our children will probably be surprised that one day that we used plastics created by petrochemicals. Um, some interesting things are happening in breeding um, in seeds. You know, seeds are the software of plant science and they, they have amazing value um, because they're able to, you know, dictate um, how a plant's going to manifest the end product. Um, stevia, for example, you know, if you get the right genetics, you can create a stevia that doesn't have a bitter aftertaste. Um, so there's going to be a lot of focus on breeding. Uh, there's also going to be a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, reflection on uh, some of the new technologies that are being applied to breeding 
um, some of the new forms of CRISPR and whether that constitutes something that um, that is interesting for the consumer or not. Um, but also this computational breeding where you're not using any uh, uh, kind of edgier forms of, of, of creating new genotypes, but uh, computational breeding using AI and machine learning to uh, analyze thousands of cultivars and determine which ones you want to cross, how many generations forward, so that you end up with the phenotypic responses that you're looking for. Um, you know, this is also coming up and we're seeing some, some very interesting companies with some great successes. Um, so I think this is, this is an area to watch um, because it is, it is the origin of the value we're all looking for. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll just mention something that I think is going to, I mean, this is, this is my backyard. Uh, it's an area where I think uh, it will continue to grow um, as the, the world is challenged by water consumption, as it's challenged by uh, unsustainable energy usage, uh, by chemicals, um, you know, a lot of the chemicals that we've been using, for example, on strawberries, methyl bromine, you know, you just can't use anymore. It's not healthy. Um, so folks are having to move indoors to protect the crops. And as a result, we're starting to get to the point where we have a closed loop system, where we can see what the plant's doing. We can tell the control system to change the environment. And then we can let the plants tell us and really tell the computer what they need and let the computer give the plants what they need to excel in their growth to create the best flavors. Um, so this is gonna be a fun time, I think, in indoor farming, everything from greenhouses to, uh, to warehouses, um, where we see new business models and new technologies in full circle get adopted and drive a lot of value. So that's kind of a quick highlight of, of some of the things that are on our mind at Sensei. Um, and uh, feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, but I'm excited to be here today and, and look forward to the conversations. Happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Great, thank you so much, um, Dave, for such insightful um, keynotes uh, session. Um, so I think we, currently can take the questions via um, uh, an email afterwards. Uh, so um, those of you who would like to uh, learn more about the technologies, uh, you can drop uh, Dave an email directly. Thanks, uh, Dave, for joining us. Thanks, everyone.